All right, moving on now to Chapter 7, Mini Lecture 7.2. Uh, topic for today is why have ethnicities been transformed into nationalities? There has been this movement, especially in recent times, where we're no, locking, no longer looking at, at it as an ethnicity, but now as a nationality. So we're going to talk about that trend today. Uh, the term nationality, we have to start with that. It means that a group that shares legal attachment and personal allegiance to a particular country, not county. Yes, you've got me, I made a typo. Um, so those two key terms there, legal attachment. Legal attachment for us is going to be shown by passports. Um, where are you officially a citizen? And personal allegiance. Now, in some cases, personal allegiance overtakes everything else, and we'll talk about that in a moment, such as you see in the upper right-hand corner, this is a picture from the U.S. Uh, Olympic hockey team in 1980, winning the gold medal. Uh, this was really a focus on personal allegiance for many Americans, because it was one of the things that helped draw and pull Americans together after what had been a very trying uh, decade in the 1970s. Now, nationality, when we talk about it, like we said already with passports, civic duties, voting, um, rights and responsibilities fall with nationality. Now, with ethnicity, what's going to separate nationality and ethnicity really is terms of political and cultural issues. Nationality is very much a political thing. Ethnicity is much more cultural. Religion, language, material culture will be uh, discussed in ethnicity versus nationality. Race, biological traits. So, we have another thing to add to the mix here. Ethnicity, biological, ethnicity, cultural, nationality, political. All right. Remember we talked about Quebec back in the language chapter. Uh, we talked about how their language makes them want to break away from the rest of Canada. Well, if you think about it, for them, they look at as being Quebecois as being a nationality, not necessarily just a cultural thing, they see it as a political thing, and on, number of, on a number of occasions, the Quebecois have tried to break away from the rest of Canada, but they have been unsuccessful in doing so. Okay, This brings up a couple of terms that we're going to talk a lot more about in Chapter 8 when we talk about political geography. The first of those is sovereignty. Sovereignty is the ability to make decisions for oneself. Okay. Now, you have personal sovereignty to a degree. Your parents have a lot more sovereignty over you till you turn 18. But for a country, what sovereignty means is a country's ability to make decisions for themselves. It's the idea and the right of self-determination that countries get to decide the route they might take in the future. Now, that term, nation-states, really comes in handy here. A nation-state is an area of land, key part one, with a defined border, part two, a legitimate, three, government, four, a homogeneous population, five, and a common culture, six. Six different items make up a nation state. Okay, area of land, defined border, legitimate government, homogeneous population, common culture. Okay, in the 20th century in Europe, the big differences we see is that the west of Europe, the states that side with the United States, became unto themselves nation states. Okay, areas of land with defined borders, legitimate governments, homogeneous population, which was for the most part determined by language and a common culture. They disagreed over the boundaries in Africa and Asia, which makes them not as likely to be nation states. In the East, we had empires that we're still dealing with. In this case, the Germans, the Russians, the Austro-Hungarians, the Italians, the Ottomans. Okay, so you start to see this separation between these two areas, and this will become even more so true after World War II. Now, World War II itself, if we take a look at the nation states in Europe, 1800, you have these different empires that are throughout the, uh, the continent, that by 2010, what we have today are lots of specific, smaller nation states. Again, following that same definition, which you need to go back and make sure you memorize. The key difference for us is between 1924 and 1989, the role that the Soviet Union will play, and we're going to talk about them a lot more here in a moment. Now, 
nationalism. Okay. Difference between nationality and nationalism. An example. We'll start with talking about Denmark. Denmark, its territory is occupied by a group of people who refer to themselves as Danish. Okay. They consider it an ethnicity. Common language, common history that corresponds to that specific peninsula sticking out into the North and Baltic Seas. Okay. They have a southern border with Germany that has a mix of Danes and Germans, so you have a little bit of a movement into that area. And then you have Denmark that also controls the Faroe Islands and Greenland off into the, uh, the Atlantic. Now, nationalism itself is loyalty and devotion to a country. Now, this can be seen through media, flags, songs, and symbols. If you remember back at the end of chapter 6 on, on uh, religion, I specifically asked you, would patriotism, nationalism, American nationalism, be considered a religion? Well, if it's taken too far, negative nationalism is something we see in a country such as Germany circa 1936. Enter Adolf Hitler, the National Socialist Party, that better known as the Nazis. Okay, This was a negative nationalism. But this gives us an opportunity to introduce a very key term. And this is one of those terms I'm going to ask you to write down, underline, double, double, triple time. The term is centripetal force. For those of you who have taken physical science or physics, you've heard of this before. But in AP Human Geography, it has a very different term. Centripetal force is an attitude or an item, geographic item, that unifies people and leads to support for a state. It helps draw things towards the center. Its opposite is centrifugal force. Centrifugal force drives people away, drives people out and away from a center. Okay, So nationalism depending on how it's being used, can be either a centripetal force, as it was for many Germans, or a centrifugal force for many of the groups that the Nazi party attempted to overrun. The Jewish population, uh, so many other groups that were oppressed by the Nazi party during the 1930s and 40s. Okay. Now, a multi-ethnic state is a state with more than one ethnicity, and they do exist. Belgium, we talked about Belgium back in the language chapter, about the Flemish and the Walloons, and how they have that, that bashing against one another. It's not just a language thing, it's an ethnic thing. The United States is another great example of a multi-ethnic state. Now, multinational states have ethnic groups who have their own history of self-determination, being able to make decisions for themselves, who try to coexist peacefully. Multi-ethnic states have never had that right to self-determination, which is why in multi-ethnic states you occasionally have some conflict between ethnic groups. What's an example of a multinational state? Best one we can use, the United Kingdom. Great Britain, and I would actually direct you at this time, pause me after I tell you about this, to search for a video uh, about how do you know what is the UK? I'll link it down in the description below where I'm talking right now. But I want you to make sure you watch over that so you know the difference between the UK and England and Great Britain. Because everybody gets this mixed up, and it's not the same thing. So, a multinational state. A state with multiple ethnic groups who retain their own distinctive national identity. The UK consists of four separate countries. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. All four of them have had the historical experience of self-determination. They've been allowed to rule themselves at some point. All of them got conquered by the British at some point. Okay? When we talk about England, Scotland, and Wales, that's the big island on the east side here, Northern Ireland off to the west. Okay? The main element is a distinctive national identity through sports today. For example, the upcoming World Cup England is in the World Cup. Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, not so much. Okay. An example of a multinational is also Russia. Russia today is the world's largest multinational state. Okay. Fifteen separate states based on fifteen different ethnicities. Three Baltic, three European, five Central Asian, three Caucasus regions, and Russia. This was the Soviet Union. Now, today, these groups are no longer part of Russia. 
it's no longer the largest multinational state. Okay? Today, Russia by itself still has parts and pieces of these populations, but for a very long time, all of this was considered part of the Soviet Union and made it the largest multinational state. Today, you have 15 smaller nation states that are trying to coexist on their own. Okay. When we talk about the former USSR, we have uh, lots of groups to consider. We first consider the Baltic states. They're pretty strong, good nation states. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, good groups to talk about. Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, they speak all languages that are similar. They're on the same apparent branch of the language tree. They're predominantly Eastern Orthodox. The Belarusians and the Ukrainians will become a little different because of five centuries of separation. As we've talked about before, separation will tear certain things apart, will allow things to develop differently in one area to another. The Crimean Peninsula, now as it exists, is actually shared by two countries, the Ukraine and Russia. Moldova. Moldova, slightly different. They are ethnically indistinguishable from Romanians. They're about the same. Okay? However, the Soviets added land to Moldova that was inhabited mostly by Ukrainians and Russians who did not want to be reun reunified with the rest, okay? which created their own national identity as Moldovans. Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan has no conflict. It actually has a better economy than everybody else. And when you've got a good economy, you typically don't need conflict. The only major Central Asian country that's suffering right now is Tajikistan. And we may talk about Tajikistan a little later in the course, especially when we start to talk about economic geography. Okay. Russia itself will recognize 39 different nationalities. Okay. It's much less willing to suppress independence movements by these groups, but when it does, you'd better watch out. Case in point, Chechnya. When Russia suppresses something, it suppresses it, big time. You can look up any number of examples for that one, but I'm not going to go into it right now, because, dude, no time. Okay, Chechnya, why didn't they allow Chechnya to break away? Because Chechnya was sitting on a ton of oil, and don't come be between Russians and their oil bad news, and as a result, the Russians crushed any attempt at rebellion by Chechnya. So why is it not good to be a Russian in a former Soviet Republic? You don't want to be Russian in one of these republics because you're blamed for everything that went wrong during the Soviet Union. I mean everything. Okay? Russian troops still remain in many of these other countries. It's a way of influence in the area, and many of these countries still remain in the Russian sphere of influence. There's scares in some of these countries about the return of the Soviets. So when people are seeing what's happening with Vladimir Putin, who's the uh, third term, <clears throat> that one in the Constitution before, uh, president of Russia, you start to see some concerns, especially in many of these former Soviet republics. Okay? They're subject to discrimination as minorities, they have difficulty voting or with civil rights, and they get passed over for hiring. You don't want to be Russian in a former Soviet Republic, which is kind of helping to make these societies a little more homogeneous, which helps them to become stronger nation states. Okay. In the Caucasus, three major groups you need to know, the Azeris, the Armenians, and the Georgians, they've all attempted to have their own uh, nation states built around them. They can all trace their history to other surrounding cultures. Uh, Georgia, you need to watch for because in South Ossetia, they've actually had a part of that country that wishes to go back and join with Russia because it's a majority Russian population. This has led to some clashes between Russia and Georgia, and no, I'm not talking about the Georgia directly to our north. Communism, as we've talked about, they didn't want languages to exist other than the main language, see Russian uh, being prevalent in all these areas, see Chinese, especially Mandarin Chinese in China today. Uh, they didn't want any religion except for that of the modern country. So again, because communism looked at uh, religion as the opiate of the masses, they didn't want to see it anywhere around. Again, take a look at what the Communist Chinese Party is doing to organize religion in China. Uh, they didn't want cultural uniqueness. They didn't want any form of ethnic pride. It was completely discouraged. It was made to be, you are Soviet. You are Chinese. This is it. Okay? The language pro was promoted. All organized religions were downplayed, uh, as well as all ethnicities. You were Russian. 
everyone was Russian, or you were Soviet, and that was it. Okay, when communism fell in 19, between 1989 and 1991, and the Soviet Union dissolved, okay, it led to nationalism, once again being important in Eastern Europe. And so we're starting to see minorities press for rights. You have the, uh, the Turks in Bulgaria, Turks around the world who are just seeking some level of, uh, some level of additional uh, power in their countries. The ethnic groups wanted to, to govern themselves, to give themselves that ability to become a thriving nation state. Anytime you see an area that was controlled by communism and it is fallen out of that control, you are going to see a rise in nationalism in the immediate aftermath. Does it become as bad as what we see in Germany in the 1930s and 40s? It hasn't become that bad yet. One would hope not. But you still need to monitor both Russia and the former Soviet republics. And we have to keep an eye on China as the only major communist power still left in the world. Well, that's all for Section 7-2. More with 7-3 in a few.